What is good, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to The Hype Report. I hope you're good. Thank you for the support on all the previous episodes so far. And today, I'm joined with uh, someone who I'm very, a big supporter of, someone I've, I've, uh, I don't know, admired for a long time. (laughs) Um, The founder of the pre-loved designer specialists, Lux Collective, aka Ben. Thank you for having me. How are you, man? You good? Yeah, I'm good. Um, It's an honor, bro. It's an honor. I'm so excited, man. I've watched your stuff for so, so long. and yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Tell the people who you are and what you do for those who don't know you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name's Ben. Uh, I founded Lux Collective with my brother in about 2018. We officially made it into like a corporation, a proper company in about December of 2020. So I've been trading now for about three years, nice. four years. And um, we buy and sell pre-love luxury goods. Uh, and similar to you, we got onto TikTok at a very similar time. And uh as you said, you're a massive admirer of me. Obviously, that's very kind, but uh, what you've done as well is crazy, crazy, crazy. Yeah, and thank you, we thank you. took, oh, when I say we, I took a lot of inspiration from the way you created your videos mm. in the aspect of storytelling, which effectively what we do on socials at the moment. Um, and that's how we've grown the brand. Yeah, got about 2.5 million followers on socials. And um, yeah. Just the 2.5 million, just the 2.5 million, yeah. which is very impressive, by the way, for uh, a company as a, because you know how hard it is to build a brand when it's not an individual. Yeah. Like it's so hard, man. So you've smashed that. Yeah. It, I get envious of uh, individuals who, who get paid to create these videos yeah. that get not a lot of views. And then we create videos as creators and businesses and get hundreds of thousands of likes never mind just views. yeah 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 and <laughs> the reward is just an ego stroke you know <laughs> yeah i guess yeah but yeah i mean mate it's it's amazing so you effectively started this out the back of your bedroom yeah and now you are here and you recently had investment from one of the dragons yeah yeah i forgot about that bit so um we went on dragons then it was last may actually so nearly a year now and uh it got aired in january yeah Genuinely one of the best experiences of my life. It was just so cool. I loved it, mate, because obviously it was like someone who, not not a cl- not close to me, but someone who operates in the same space. Yeah, yeah. Getting glow, not glow, but like national yeah, recognize- yeah, yeah. Rec- recognition. Yeah. Um, and it was amazing, man. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just insane. Like we got like a million people on the website that night. Wow. It was honestly unbelievable. Did, did, did you see a big result in sales or was it just nah, impressions? So, we, so we, we couldn't have gone on Dragon's Den at a worse time, to be honest, because... It was just off the back of November and December, uh, so Black Friday, the okay, last quarter okay. of the year where you want to sell all your stuff. We sold through 80% of our stock, so we had about 300 items on the site in January when it went live, because it was the very beginning of January, it's January yeah. the 4th. Wow, okay. So, so we had no stock, but what it did do is obviously going on national TV and something like that, it's like better than a blue tick on Instagram, you know? Like the verification you get from it is just crazy. And just like the people reaching out to you and the companies reaching out to you wanting to work off the back of it. But also like the products we sell aren't a split buying decision. So a lot of companies that go on Dragon's Den are like 30, 40, 50 pound average order. Like ours is like five, six, 700 pounds. So like people aren't going to watch the TV show, go on the site and instantly buy. Quick little, quick little buy. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a big, it's like an investment type It's just another touch point for our customers and potential customers. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it 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 couldn't have gone any better, to be honest. I think the content we produced off the back of it was just incredible. Yeah, it flew, man, didn't it? I was looking at a bit, when I was doing a bit of research last night, I was looking at the uh, the spike. And I mean, your view, like you said, your views are amazing regardless, but I saw like this massive spike around like early Jan or whatever. Yeah. It was obviously when that shit was going down. But yeah. I mean, there can't be many, many brands who have been on TikTok to go on Dragon's Den like that. And No, 100%. Because I think TikTok would... Uh, came out in like 2020 it never came out then but that's when everyone started to be interested by it yeah so yeah. like it's only been like three or four years and not many people not many businesses have had so much traction and especially the models that they're in they wouldn't want to go on dragons then mm. but for us it's like how do we create more hype and attention around the brand because it's such a such a niche but also we know the market's grown and the market's out there so yeah i i i've i've looked up to Stephen for many many years i put up a picture on my instagram of actually messaging him like three years ago saying like you inspire me that's every sick. day yeah and sick. then obviously got him as a got that's, him as a dragon that's, a, that's cool man that's yeah. like you gotta sit on that for a long time that's amazing yeah so it was just to be honest it wasn't like go on tv and get in front of all these people it was like 
get in front of Stephen Bartlett in yeah. any way possible. And that was the way. And how how yeah. do you even get on Dragon's Den? Do you just reach out to them? Well, they reached out to us initially and then we applied through the link they sent us and then we didn't hear anything back. And then one day I was just like bored in the office. I was like looking through my emails and I must have come across it again. And I was like, all right, I'll just, I'll just apply again. Yeah. So I went on it, applied, heard back about a month later. And then the process was so long from there. Because I think we were one of the first to apply because we applied in maybe the back end of 2022 and we didn't go on until May 2023. Yeah, and then it doesn't even air until... Yeah, so the process was like 18 months long. Wow. Yeah, it was so long. Incredible but, though. Anyone who's got a small business out there, I definitely recommend doing it. Yeah, that's sick, man. It's such, a, such, a, such an interesting story. You don't hear too much of... Uh, like the back end of it and how you actually get onto it and stuff well, like that. Well, that's what, from like a creator and content point of view, that was what I wanted to do. And the uh, BBC actually messaged me when I started creating some content and they made me delete a couple of posts because they were like, you can't say that, you can't say that, you can't say that. Because I was just giving too much away. Because obviously everyone likes transparency, everyone likes to know behind the scenes. And I was saying some certain stuff and they were like, you can't do that, you can't no do that, way. you can't do that. So, but they were banging on socials like... I posted it the day after we went on Dragon's Den and within an hour, I don't know what this is like for your ratio, but in, within an hour, it was on like 400k views. And I was like, this is banging. Wow. And then I got a call off them and they were like, yeah, you're going to have to take that down because you've signed this contract. So if you don't take it down, we'll have to uh, remove your episode. And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> Damn. Bro, that would have hit big, big numbers, man. I know. Well, 400k is, is huge. But how, so how did this actually start? So how did you how did you get into effectively reselling designer stuff i mean did it start by actually selling like a louis vuitton bag in your in your bedroom no so so there's a lot of what we do down in london so like there's a lot of we call them like mom and pop stores so like american version mom and dad stores like there's tons of them where rich women just open a shop in london because they have such a big collection they're like oh i need to sell it i'll just open a shop and a lot of them start that way so so like we went from that type of background but we were always entrepreneurial and the idea of luxury goods just came from my sister ordering a pair of shoes off a similar website. So I was like, at the time I was looking at building, building my own thing that just happened to be front of mind because mm. she'd got them for Christmas. And I was like, Oh, like this is how we can afford secondhand goods, uh, afford luxury goods by buying them secondhand. So then I went to my brother cause I had no money at the time. I had like 200 quid. I was like to my brother, can we start a business doing pre-loved luxury goods? But I think we're going to have to start with footwear because bags are really expensive. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, how much money have you got? And he was like, a thousand pounds. I was like, okay, not loads, but it's more than that. Yeah, it's enough. Yeah. So we started the business with 1200 pounds. We started with footwear because obviously it was cheaper, but in Liverpool at the time and in the UK at the time, luxury sneakers were like, becoming really big so that that would have been like what the balenciaga triple s's and that yeah. kind of speed runner type wave because everyone 100%. wanted them alexander mcqueen's yes oh but my like, god do you yes. know what it was probably just before the triple s and the speed shoes were going massive yeah it was when they were like so the triple s was introduced in 2015 this was about 2018 yeah but it was like they were banging then because yeah. like when they first came out everyone thought like they were like lego shoes like no one was gonna wear yeah, them yeah yeah like yeah no one really wanted and then them by 2020 while. everyone had them like they've been they like they still are now one of our best sellers yeah like people just love having them and um, so we started with shoes because we knew that the people down south all the companies that were doing similar to what we wanted to do they weren't really touching footwear. So we were like, okay, it's easier to authenticate. It's cheaper. And there's a market there already for it in Liverpool. So I was like, okay, let's start with that. And then we weren't ever going to go into bags. Like we never thought we'd get to this stage where we're at now. Mm. So like we never had the idea of doing bags ever. And then we had like this client and she was like, oh, I've got six or seven bags here. Do you want to just take them off me and try and sell them? And we put them on the page and they sold out within like a day. Wow. And we made a lot of money on so them. So was that just on your own? You had your own small website at the time? No, we were just selling through Instagram. Wow. Literally just selling through nice. Instagram. We probably got to about 11, 12,000 followers. Nice. But like, it was so niche. Like it was so saturated. Core like all community. the, yeah, yeah, all the yeah, it wasn't yeah. necessarily a community because Back then on Instagram, it wasn't like community building. It was like, like pre-love stuff is like back then was like people's dirty little secret. 
you know like they didn't want like we got messages all the time uh, saying don't tell people i'm buying this off you wow or so don't was, tell yeah. people i'm selling this to you it's shame isn't it like people were ashamed of kind of yeah. buying like stuff that wasn't 100 100 percent. but now it's cool completely reversed so like that's why i i say this and you'll relate to this a lot like because you've had so much success on tiktok and we've had so much success in what we do like not saying we're successful but we've had success in what we do mm. is you've got to have and I think this is everyone's success is like right place, right time. Like we would, like me and you definitely were right place, right time yeah. in terms of getting on TikTok and wanting to create and having a mindset of, oh, I just want to create videos for people. But then the second one is something that you can control and that's you just never give up. Like you just create and buy and sell or do whatever you're doing every day until it works. Mm. And that's what you've done with your videos because you've been so consistent with them. And that's effectively what we've done with our videos and business. Yeah, Like it's those two things, like never giving up and right place, right time. And that is, and if you never give up, you will eventually get in the right place, right time. Yeah, Because like I said, we were so early on pre-love stuff and like it was embarrassing it was people's dirty little secret and now it's the coolest thing yeah like the biggest luxury brands in the world they're now doing it they have their some uh, is it is it is it i don't know if it's far fetch or end or whoever it has has their own pre-love section they all they all site. do or they all work with a company who do it for them uh, okay some of it's for greenwashing but they're still taking part in it which yeah, shows yeah, there's yeah, yeah. so much scope the for it. Is, yeah and the pre-love market's actually growing three times quicker than the primary market wow which is amazing but, oh yeah for so many reasons man yeah i guess it's is it well i mean you, you i guess it's a pretty difficult question but i imagine with with the cost of living crisis now i imagine more people will be turning to fill their consumer habits by going pre-loved right? yeah well it's interesting so like like the cost of living crisis affects everyone right but like with pre-loved, it's you could also you could argue that it's a benefit for us, like you just said, because mm. people are wanting to sell to get more yeah, money, but yeah. they're also wanting to buy cheaper product. And as soon as people buy product off us, like the consensus of a lot of people is, like, I can't believe I haven't done this earlier. Do you know what I mean? Because the product is so good and they're getting it for cheaper, which means they can essentially buy more if they want to yeah. or have money left over to buy other things. Um, and we're also supplying that service of, being able to buy stuff off people and take it off their hands. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's such a good business model to be involved in. Tough, super, super tough. And I'm really glad that my first ever business is this business model because, as you know, when when you uh, were reselling stuff and still do, like, it's such a tough, such a tough model. It is, and it is, it's got this massive... Uh, misconception that you become filthy rich from reselling <laughs> a few shoes and yeah. they think it's this kind of like dark arts when it really really isn't you're yeah. moving like obviously it's different for you because i imagine your margins are uh, because of the type of stuff you sell the margins are very different to like our kind of level of shoes yeah but it's very much for us just get something in and because we're, we're a lot smaller than, yeah. than yourself and you probably went through this initially yeah it was like get something in and then get the cash flow going again get yeah, rid of it, yeah, man. yeah you don't want to sit on product i think this again is a big misconception of of, of resellers yeah. wanting to or like people who, who view resellers wanting to kind of like that they should sit on stock and yeah. should should uh invest in sneakers and invest in shoes when the reality is you can do that if you are very 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 yeah well known and respected and have a lot of money yeah but the reality is you know that's not the best well you know, in my opinion it's not the best no 100 percent. like uh the company like the biggest companies in our space in america in europe like they are either still not profitable or only just becoming profitable after 20 years wow and like they've had investment so like this business model is so tough for people so like it's such a long-winded way to create wealth from but like you just gotta like decide like, am I doing it to create wealth or am I doing it to learn or am I doing it to just because I love it? Yeah. But like, as long as you can survive, as long as you're not losing money yeah. or as long as by three years time, you're going to be making all the money back that you've lost, like it's fine. Like I do this with my brother every single day. Yeah. Like we've got a team of 35 people now, probably gonna be like 50 by the end of the year, maybe 45, something like that. Like we're just like super proud of what we've created. Like my brother has flown all over the world in sourcing product. Yeah, like sick. I've been able to fly all over the world going to fashion shows. Like we've created a really tight knit team and we've just invested in a 12,000 square foot unit. Like we're just living a really like cool like life because 
we just wake up every day loving what we do you know yeah and that is that is like wealth and it's success in itself yeah, and money absolutely. aside just just that is 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 the peak so a couple of kind of uh clickbaity questions here so yeah, aiden, yeah. aiden take notes what is the uh most expensive item you ever sold Ooh, just like in terms of actual like sole price and maybe not margins and profit yeah. just no no that's fine um sold something yesterday on the website for like 7k wow Sold sold a few bits for seven k. I'll probably say the most is about eight and a half k. Yeah. Um. But yeah, regularly regularly sell stuff between like four and eight k on the website. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Um, they, would they, would what, what products are they? Mostly bags. Chanel bags. Okay, yeah. So okay. and MS as well. But we don't sell too much MS because like the like you said with the cash flow, like it's just so tough. Yeah. Holding that product if you're not selling it quick enough. But Chanel classic flat bags, we sell them regularly and um like so the thing is with them is you can't buy like if you're in need of one or in what like you're wanting one so bad you can't really buy them from the shops mm. so essentially people just look to get them pre-loved but they're about two to three grand cheaper than new when you buy them pre-loved and if you get a good condition one then you absolutely smashed it because in five to six years if you want to get rid of it if you keep it in good condition you could sell it for more than what you bought it for yeah, pre-loved. yeah so it's a, it's a bit of an investment you know oh those bags that you're spending over 5k on are one million percent an investment. Really, a hundred percent. That's it's really, it's really interesting, man. What? Um, I had a really really good question. Why can't you buy a Chanel bag from the shop? Just because they're very snooty and they're very like brand protective, so they don't want everyone. So I couldn't go in there now. Uh, it to depends. Try. Like if you get a good SA, they might be like, "Oh yeah, here it is," but they're just wanting commissions. Okay. Do you know what I mean? So like, so you just, you, you it's right place, right time. And is 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 it true about how sometimes having to spend X amount of money in order to get the next like, yeah, highest yeah, yeah. model bag? One hundred percent. So if you want like the best one, which is the classic flap, which is the most in demand one. The essays will be like, yeah, you have to spend like not a certain amount, which is a fixed figure, but they're like, oh, you need to buy these pair of shoes and then come back in a month and buy this this wallet and then come back in a, wow. and then buy this cheaper bag and then we'll offer you the bag that you want, you know? Okay, that's crazy. Yeah. Especially from, from someone like myself in my space. Like if I wanted to buy that with a pair of shoes, I, <laughs> I don't think it really doesn't really happen. You get you obviously get very premium pairs of shoes. Yeah, yeah. But it's very, diff very, very different to that. If you walk into a sneak store, you can, a resale store, they will let you have it if you've got the money to buy it. A hundred percent. Like the Hermes kind of example is just ludicrous. Like you will walk in there and they'll have bags there and they'll have them laid out and they're like, oh, you'll be like, oh, can I buy this one? Mm. And they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, well, he's like, why? Well, I just like, oh, I just can't, sorry. That's crazy. I know. They like Hermes... Unless you go, I've heard that the one in Paris is very lenient, but like not very lenient, just lenient compared to everyone else. So how, how do, you, do you have to be a regular customer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like you have to build a relationship up with your sales associate. Wow. So you, ha you can't just go, you can't go to loads of different stores. You've got to go to the same yeah, one consistently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or you can, they can, you can go to different stores, but if you use the same account and you go to, you just have to have one, one like point of contact. Yeah. So if you go to another store, you'll be like, oh, this is my essay in, in my normal store. But it, it really helps if you go to the same person. All so if the I wanted time. to buy Hermes bag right now, yeah. Uh, or, or on a, one of their products, yeah. what would I have to start with? Probably just like a scarf. Wow. And how or, much would that send me back? So like that you have to start with their most profitable items because uh, like they don't make that much money on the on the on the bigger ticket items. So like they're ready to wear stuff, their smaller SLGs, their homeware stuff, like that's where they make the margin. So so the essays will push that on you, like the cushions, you've seen the blankets of Hermes, you know, um the shoes, like they make so much money on that. And then they're like, if you spend a certain amount, the essays will be like Okay, you deserve one now. So, so the bags aren't the most like the how much? What's the retail one of the bags? Seven k, so ten, ten about ten to twelve thousand dollars. Wow, so about seven thousand pounds, eight thousand pounds. So, so, so ten thousand dollars, and that's not the most pro profitable item. But you, but you can buy it for about seven k, eight k, and then if you get hold of it, you could resell it for like fifteen, twenty k. Wow, in the same day. Wow. Yeah. And where would you resell it on like, any marketplace, eBay, something like that? Yeah. E well, Everywhere, everyone's if you it. go to like a reseller like us, like we wouldn't pay that, but there are resellers out there that w that do because we don't really deal with MS. It's a bit too premium for our customers. Yeah, yeah. Um, don't get me wrong, like it's future goals and stuff like that, but our core customer at the moment 
is just not spending that much that much money. Right, on, I get on, that. Yeah, <laughs> I get that. I get that. That's so interesting. That's what I said to you before the podcast. I was like, I'm so fascinated by stuff like that. Yeah, like because it's mind blowing. Yeah, like although I'm not, I'm definitely no specialist and designer at all, but I am in the world a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and Stone just, Island, you do with yeah, a lot. In yeah. It. yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. just it's so interesting when I watch your vids and I I, I listen to stuff like that. Yeah, it's just so crazy, man. Yeah. Because we were talking about the outlets before, innit? Yes. So this is another good question, Aiden. You need to make note of this one. Um, you, you made a video recently explaining, and I need to word this one correctly, explaining that some designer brands effectively fake their own bags. Yeah. So obviously it's not faking, but so for outlets, the luxury brands will create lesser quality products to put there. So it's called MFO. So made for outlet. Yeah. So... It's effectively a way in to get people who aren't customers of the brands to buy the brands and then effectively turn them over to where they make the most money, which is in their genuine proper, not genuine, but proper retail yeah, stores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you'll go to places like Bista Village, Cheshire Oaks, those types of uh, uh, outlet villages. You'll go, there'll be very basic shapes, there'll be very basic materials, but they will have the brand badge on. They are made still by the luxury brands, but they're just nowhere near the quality of what the stores are. Okay. So so, so the, what, what's different? So would this be the same product, just different material effectively? Or? No, so it would be a very similar shape. Yeah. So like a tote bag shape, which is just basically like a tri an upside down yeah, yeah, yeah. triangle or like quadrilateral. And like, it's very, very similar to to the to the to the actual thing but it's just like a basic dumbed down version so people can have access to the brand and then you get their email it's basically like a lead generation yeah for the brand um but don't get me wrong in the outlets as well they do put the real product next to it and the essays have to actually say that it's made for outlet if you ask them so if you go up to them and be like look this is feels different is there a reason why is it just specifically for the outlet they have to say yes that's so interesting. So yeah. uh, you're talking like Louis Vuitton, Chanel, stuff like that. No, not Louis Vuitton. So Louis Vuitton, Chanel don't do it. It's more places that are owned by like Kering. So that's LVMH. So Kering is like Gucci, yeah. Pra no Prada are the, their own, but they also, they do do that. Uh, Saint Laurent, uh, Alexander McQueen's Kering. So Kering is basically like the parent group. Yeah. So you've got four main parent groups in the luxury industry, which is Kering, which owns Gucci, Saint Laurent, um, uh, Bottega Veneta, most of the Italian brands. Then you've got LVMH, who own most of the French brands, which is like uh, Louis Vuitton, Dior, uh, Fendi, I think is LVMH as well. And then you've got Tapestry, which is like the American version. So you've got Michael Kors, coach unsure whether mark jacobs is in there um but yeah that's like the american side of it and then richmond which is like the ultra ultra premium so they've got uh like watch brands and they have got a few fashion brands but i can't think off the top of my head but yeah, yeah. they're like the four main parents yeah but lvmh owns like 80 percent of it wow and then it's probably caring and then richmond and then tapestry in the u.s damn you're so knowledgeable about this, man. <laughs> so, 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 so. Honestly, I can listen. I can listen to this all day. Uh, well, another, another thing I wanted to query you on was I saw the pyramid about designer. Yes. Talk to me about that because I am definitely no expert in terms of where stuff is. A few were like the mainstream common brands. Let's rank them a little bit. Yeah. So, so you to so the triangle is like accessibility and price. So if it's very accessible and low price, it will be at the bottom. If it's um, sorry, if it's high accessibility and low price, it'll be at the bottom. If it's low accessibility and high price, it'll be at the top. Okay. So let's put the bottom tier is like high accessibility and lower in price in like the luxury sphere. So you've got like Marc Jacobs and Coach, which I think are fantastic brands if you want to get into the luxury world. Yeah. Like Coach, I used to hate it. And similar to Mulberry as well. I used to think old women for coach, old women for Mulberry. But like in the past few years, coach in particular and Mark Jacobs have changed their marketing completely. And it's so Gen Z focused and it's so clever. And like, I think they are killer brands. Like mm. I love them so much. Like the product they offer is just fantastic for people wanting to enter that world, you Entry know? Entry level, yeah. 100%. And then you've got like the mid brand, which is like, semi-accessible so like that means in terms of like 
product demand, product supply and cost, like the price of the product that you're paying for. So these will probably range, if we're talking about bags, between 700 and a thousand pounds. So, or 1200 pounds. So these are probably brands like Bottega Veneta, Chloe. What other brands would be in here? Um, hmm, I'm trying to think of the ones we sell on our website. Hmm. Coach, you could put Fendi in there. Yeah. You could put Alexander McQueen in there. You could put... Hmm. All the brands I'm thinking of are just that top tier. Let's move on to the top yeah, tier. Yeah, we go top tier. So the top, top tier, tier are like very, very expensive and very, very low in demand. So if we leave the last one, which is just so hard to get your hands on, but then you've got like Louis Vuitton, which is quite accessible, but very, very expensive. Dior, which is super, super expensive. Um, Chanel is probably in that in that um, sphere. And then you've got Lueve, which is just an amazing brand. I absolutely love it. And then like Celine. And then the top, top, top one is the one we discussed before, which is Hermes. Yeah. Wow. Mm. So like even in the luxury world, there is cheap luxury stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, and there's mid luxury so many, stuff. Yeah, in that subculture, there's so How many How would you do that in the sneaker world and the sneaker brands? Like what brands would you put in that pyramid? See, the thing is with sneakers, the the obviously luxury is based on trends as well, but the the, the, the trends and the hype change so much yeah. in sneakers. Like, I mean, like that. Yeah. I mean, you can look at stuff like where Yeezy is now. Yeah. Yeezy is probably right at the bottom. Yeah. Like, I mean, I mean, we we buy we sell a lot of Yeezys because the universal hype was so so big, and people yeah. still want that shoe, like a Yeezy three fifty, for example, because that time period when it was popping made such an impact. People still wear it now, or wear them now. But you, we we bought a pair of twenty eight quid earlier today. Really, a pair of blue tints, like off Depop. Like, yeah, yeah. We are uh, someone. Someone was that well, someone who works for us was buying them, um, and he's like, "There's no insoles, but he's got them down from forty to twenty eight quid. Should I buy them?" I was like, "Yeah, just grab them." Yeah, we're selling for like fifty. I took my insoles out my Yeezys. Yeah, a lot of people do that, yeah. man. Yeah, a lot of people do that. Uh, there's two reasons. One, because uh, insoles are a really good way of telling if they're authentic. So a lot of people who, who have fakes oh, can get rid of them, really? but also they are a lot more comfortable because you go directly on the, uh, yeah, the yeah, boost yeah. foam thing. Yeah, hundred yeah. yeah. percent. Yeah, I had the uh, Wave Runners. Oh yeah, I got a wave on a stair fire. Yeah, they're they're like they're like, they're, they're they are still acceptable in the cool kids. Yeah, yeah, I went through a phase of just being obsessed with Kanye. Probably like yeah. twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two. Yeah. Oh, I was just obsessed with everything he did. I just thought he was a marketing genius. Now yeah. I look at him and I just think, oh, you're a bit of a twat. Yeah, he's he's he, he's kind of lost his is I say he's lost his way. He's still. I don't know even want to think about how much money he's earning, yeah. but he's he's so adored by so many people. He can kind of do what he wants, but yeah, it's. Uh, I just used to like when his documentary came out. I must have watched it four times on repeat. It was just amazing. And yeah, then, like, yeah, especially his younger years. They were because they, he obviously interned at Fendi, didn't he, with yeah. um, Virgil yeah, and, yeah. and uh, I think it was someone else there as well. But they learned a lot together. Yeah, and yeah, he start they started in luxury. Well, he got jealous of of well, not jealous, but like who knows, hey? But like the rumor is that. He got jealous of Virgil Abloh when he got the Louis Vuitton creative director job because mm. he thought that job was for him. Yeah. And then he didn't speak to Virgil for ages. And uh, then Virgil died. Yeah. Which is obviously sad. That's very, very, very sad. But he was, he, he I mean, let's talk about Virgil because he was someone yeah, who, yeah. who actually crossed, uh, this is actually, I don't know why I didn't write this down. I'm an idiot. I don't know how I didn't think about this. But um, yeah, he was so influential yeah. in both sides of our like uh, what we do. Crossover in our world. For Huge sure. crossover, man. I mean, how, how did that, you know, you you give a little bit of yeah. So with Virgil, he obviously he he's ju he was just like he's like the modern was was the modern archetype of like what everyone should be like chasing what they love, chasing what they enjoy. Like that, I think it's called ikigai in Japan. Like do what makes you money, do what you enjoy, and do what is a service to the world. And if you can find that midpoint in between all of those, then you you just you've you, you've completed life. You yeah, know? you've you've won. You've you found what you found what you're here to do. Mm. And I think like he was at the the pinnacle of, of that. Like he did everything. Like he did uh, architecture in uni. Yes. He, he yeah, was he did, doing yeah. um starting clothing brands like when he was a kid. He was he was doing skateboarding all the time. He was doing DJing. He um designed with like you said, Fendi, and then he 
created his own brand. What did he do before Off White? Uh, Pyrex. Pyrex. And they had these these crazy. Yes. So initially, what he would do, he would get Ralph Lauren blanks. Yeah. The the um like flannel shirts, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Just print them on the back. Yeah, twenty three Pyrex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, <laughs> I don't know, they moved for so much money, man. People yeah. resold for so much, and I think now because he's he's obviously no, unfortunately, no longer here. I, I mean, people still represent that, and it's a great. Um, I think at the time he got a lot of shit from it, but. Uh, obviously because he was effectively just like ripping off these hundred percent blanks but it was so crazy man I was the first guy to do shit like that but people get shit for being ahead of their time yeah you for know? sure like he was so ahead of his time yeah. like he was it was they were he was repurposing like you said like ralph Lauren. like it was outlet stuff as well he would go oh, and just really? get so much stuff and then just print it on the back that's, that's so how he could sick. create so much margin because they were so cheap yeah and he would sell them for loads but what he did was like he did these really cool campaigns that no brands were doing at the time like they were quite dark they were quite weird but he got people talking about his brand like he was just a great trader of attention you know and then he obviously did off-white which was just fantastic, unbelievable. And then Louis Vuitton were in desperate need of a freshen up. Like they were dying. Like Mark Jacobs did an amazing job from like 2000, no, 1997, Mark Jacobs took over uh, Louis Vuitton. Then I think he left in like 2007 or 2008, maybe a little bit later. And then Nicola Gasquier took over and then they were just like dead. Like yeah. From 2012, they just created crap. So I think Virgil Abloh took over in 2018. Or was it was it 2017? It was one of the two. I'm not sure, mate. Yeah. And he just merged the world, like he merged the worlds of streetwear, luxury, but just like I said to you before, he just made them so culturally relevant. Yeah. Like they did collabs with Nike, they did Supreme collabs. It was just an amazing time. It was crazy, man. I mean, that was a, such a bizarre era, and I think obviously. You know, I'm probably a little bit biased because of my like upbringing with Supreme, but I mean that collaboration with LV was was absolutely insane. It was just not, like it was so tacky, but yeah, amazing it was. at the same time. It was unbelievable, and then every every relevant person with money wanted to buy that. I yeah. mean, we're talking like footballers, like yeah. celebrities, like Justin Bieber, like all these insane celebrities are rocking an LV Supreme Bogo. What piece sticks out to you the most of that collection? You know, there's actually loads. Really? Like, there's so many. I mean, look, just the collection in general, they made so much stuff. Yeah. Like, they, there's so many accessories. Like, if you go on to StockX and show what they released, they did, like, gloves, sunglasses, yeah. wallets, multiple different wallets. Like, obviously, the OG, like, the Louis Vuitton, like, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. what do you call them? Like, card holders and stuff like that. I think the... Um, the, the 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 bogo hoodie was was the, red, and, the bright red one yeah. with the white lvs yeah i was gonna and then say that. that's that was the most iconic and the chest was really cool yeah they had that massive chest it was probably like the size of that maybe yeah. a little bit bigger but yeah just covered in the lv print and you said so tacky man kind of yeah. like kind of gross to an extent but everyone loved it yeah and it was just like wow it was such a crazy time to be alive and obviously because of the numbers they were moving for i think people were naturally interested yeah it was mate it was it was and then it created a whole like like they were pioneers of, of those worlds collaborating then mm. you saw like gucci do some fit like collaborate with with streetwear brands like gucci palace they oh, did yeah. something yeah they yeah they've done they've done quite a few uh yeah they did do that uh prada and adidas and gucci they've done, and adidas yeah and uh gucci also done north face which isn't yeah. streetwear but it's, that was sick that was that, that, that was jacket. i loved it billy, had, uh, there's a picture of billy eilish wearing it yeah and it's just amazing yeah i remember there's there was there was loads of uh loads of images of like celebrities and uk celebrities rocking it yeah. as well going around with like molly may i remember when she was yeah. wearing it, everyone went crazy about that but that all came off the back of uh, the Supreme Louis Vuitton club. Yeah. On the subject of Virgil, we obviously had his 3% rule, which yeah. was, I mean, you, you'll be better explaining it than I am. Yeah. Was it not 7%? Was it 3%? I thought it was free. Was it I three? Think it was free. Yeah. It this was is embarrassing if I get it wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was free. Yeah. So, oh no, sorry. Yeah. It was seven things. Mm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We got the numbers mixed up there. So basically, if you, <laughs> he was all about the world, world of ideation and embracing creativity and not pulling people down if they're inspired by a very similar idea. And you see that from Louis Vuitton and especially Off-White. They they effectively just take other people's ideas and just change them by, like you said, 3%, which the whole rule was, he's quoted saying it, it's like, if you have an idea and you've got at least seven things different from the idea. So for example, a shoe, you could take what I'm wearing now, the Adidas campuses. And if you change the aglet on the lace, the type of plastic you mm. use, if you 
change the way the stripe is is angled if you change if you put one more hole in if you change the color of stitching if you change seven different little things like that then it's a new thing and it's your creation yeah that's because i mean that's effectively what he did with his that's with such his, a good question with his um with his uh night collaboration i mean he had like do you have 10 shoes i mean he had 10 shoes yeah i'm not going mean, 10 shoes that was in 17 18 something like that I, i'm not quite sure remember this now. the off-white one yeah yeah I mean, off white and Nike, and that was groundbreaking as well. Another yeah, like huge... we've got on our website the Nike Chicago Jordan highs off whites. Yeah. They are they're we're selling them for like five six grand. Like very expensive, man. They they're are unbelievable. One of the sickest shoes. They're crazy. And then so they sick. also got you got the blue ones as well, the UNCs. Yeah. And then uh, the red, the Chicago's as well, the best. Though. Yeah, definitely, man. But that whole he's done since they done so many so many cool shoes. They had the night the Air Max ninety seven. Uh, they was done with Serena Williams. What they, are the ones with all the bubbles as well? Uh, the Vapor Max. The Vapor Max. Yeah, they were sick because they the Vapor Max were really Vapor Max were introduced to um, kind of combat uh, the Adidas Ultra Boost wave. Ah, as it was like Nikes. Okay. You, I mean, you remember that when yeah, Adidas yeah, Ultra yeah. Boost were well, popping, man. I did work experience when they were when they were banging. Like really? so, when I did when I went to Adidas headquarters in Stockport, I went there for like five days, I think it was, and like everything was just ultra boost yeah. it was crazy and do you know what the, what ultra boost is made of so they showed us it was just so weird so it's like these little silver or clear like transparent pellets oh, really? and they warm them up and they create that foam like when oh, they get to a certain wow. temperature so it pops out and heat it heats ah. up and goes into that type of foam crazy yeah, yeah. i mean because because everyone lo everyone loved that foam i remember people were buying like balls that were uh, were just made up of the foam and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. And yeah. Then, yeah. Anyway, the the ultra boost wave was crazy, and then obviously Vapor Max and Nike was like, "Oh shit, we need a comfy shoe, yeah, which can combat Yeezy and Ultra Boost." The three sixties as well. They were so sick. Yeah, so sick. Really, really cool, man. They and Adidas were were like Air Max twenty fifteens, and then I think they did twenty seventeens as well. But twenty fifteen ones were just class. Yeah, yeah, man. They were they were crazy, and yeah, they we we sold off white Vapor. We sold quite a few pairs, man. They, Do you know what my favorite pair of Nikes are ever? What like the the silhouette. Hirachis, the, really? the original ones, just so I was obsessed with them. In yeah, high school. they were. I mean, they were like an, another OG man. Like if I could popping. have a wardrobe of one shoe, it would be them. Really, hundred percent. Yeah, I'm, I used to own what, one pair back in the day when I was a lot younger, but I haven't touched them since. But they are, I appreciate them. You know? Yeah, me and my brother had about. Well, I say me and my brother. My brother had them and I just robbed them off him when we were kids. Really? He must have had about five or six pairs. Uh, on a subject, a massive question for your culture and where <laughs> from you're from, that, that sounded weird, but from where you're from, um, is the 95 versus 110 conversation. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. What do you call them? 110s, for really, sure. Really, 110s. Yeah. I, that, yeah. My favourite videos, man, watching these like Scouse lads go around like the town centre and just asking people like, yeah. like uh, no one will say 95s. Yeah, no yeah, No one yeah. will say 95s. No, it's, uh, it's such a culture thing. Yeah. And it's just because they were 110 quid when they first came and uh, and like even though they've gone up in price, I think they're like 140, 50, 60 I, now. I bought my brother a pair um, and I, I can say this because by the time he watches this, it will be it gone past his birthday. But I bought a pair of 90, what, well, MX 95s, 110s, whatever, <laughs> for 180 quid. What? yesterday or two days ago from JD by <laughs> mind they're amazing I love JD uh, but yeah very, it's such very a expensive. funny thing though because when you go to Liverpool like one in three people are wearing them yeah they make, they're amazing shoe man but they have like in because they were such a big thing in Liverpool they have the sickest pairs so they'll have like yeah. they'll have like the spark blues are they called or blue sparks yeah yeah, uh, yeah. and they'll have like the chili reds which are like that's cool they're like 2008 OGs yeah like, so like prop I mean oh so sick I mean Air, Ma Air Max heads are, 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 are big collectors they man. even brought yeah. out like a Liverpool and Everton version did they yeah 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 so the Liverpool version were like red and then uh, that's they, cool. they had that's like cool. a they had like a red tongue and like a red inner sole, so they weren't like the original ones, but you could kind of blend them as the original ones. Yeah. And then the Everton ones were obviously blue, so like you could walk through the city and see who supported do you, who. Do you notice a um, contrast in style going from from where well, from Liverpool, let's yeah. just say, to here? Because I know there's a lot of uh, I don't even know what you call it, but like active wear, sportswear. Yeah, yeah, loads of sportswear up north. Yeah, man. so Liverpool is like so so different to the whole rest of the UK in terms of style. So like it has really good style, but it has its own style. But the thing is everybody wears it. Like yeah. they have one style. Like it's so, it's so like, I don't know what the word would be, but one dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like it's so trend based. So like one year it was like Maharishi combats. 
like everyone in Liverpool wearing like Maharishi combats. And then the next year it was like on track suits and everyone just wears on track suits with either on running trainers or Air Max 95. They, that, they you, do you know what off, I mean? Yeah. Like, but like, it, and then all the girls would wear, I don't know what the brands of the, what the girls wear, but it's all the same stuff. So you go, walk through Liverpool city centre and everyone just looks the same. What do you prefer? The style up there or down? Well, uh, not down here. It's so diverse, but like. Yeah, no, I think being in London, you just get, like you said, it's such, di it's so diverse. And what I think what people do in London really well compared to Liverpool is like, they embrace their own identity so comfortably. I think in Liverpool, because it's such a small city, yeah, it's there's lots of pressure to fit in a set be, and be a I certain see. way. Yeah, I see. So like people, people would just copy what their friends have got, and yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the the leader of that friendship group would just copy what their older brother has got, or the people that they know who's older. And like it's that thing of like from top to bottom, people are very similar in the way they dress. And if you step out your comfort zone and wear something a bit odd, people will like everyone will look at you walking past and be like, what the hell? But like in London, everyone's like that person yeah. who doesn't want to step out of their comfort zone in Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's, there's pros and cons to both both of it. Yeah, definitely. But man. I would definitely want Liverpool to embrace the culture of London fashion a little bit a little more, bit you know? More. Okay, yeah. okay. But you can understand why that happens. Yeah, oh, 100%. Very, yeah, completely. You, no understand. one wants to be the black sheep, you know? No, 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 100%. And you still, still, I think that's definitely something that uh, I, I experienced as uh, being uh, when I was younger. I think it's definitely that kind of, uh, everyone goes through it at some point. But yeah. maybe in London, when you get older a little bit, it diversifies a little yeah, bit yeah, more. Yeah. But anyway, so a question I, I, or a topic I really wanted to, uh, really wanted your opinion on yeah. being someone who, probably lives with this daily is uh authentication and fakes <laughs> yeah now the fakes have always been around for a very long time fake people faking or not and counterfeiting stuff for forever yeah but especially in our game now it is i imagine well it, it must be at a record high and it's through yeah. the roof and well, it's at a place where it's uh every it feels like every other person is, is messing with reps yeah well louis vuitton was the first brand to combat counterfeiters back in the day so louis vuitton were founded in 1854 and it was by this guy louis vuitton he just used to make trunks like you said with the supreme yeah, one before okay. just those, those like cases so he used to make trunks they were made out of wood and like people would just copy his style like, like he was like revolutionary with the trunks. Like yeah, no yeah. one really did, really did trunks. He created them, but such the high quality. And then his son came in called George Vuitton. And he was like, I'm sick of all these people like copying us. Yeah. So we started to put like a stripe, like stripes on them. So not the pattern you see today, but literally just stripes. So that it created like a, sim like a status symbol. So if you were walking around with this trunk on that had stripes, you knew it was from George and Louis Vuitton. Got ya, got ya. And then... Um, a few years later, like the stripes were really easy to uh, counterfeit as well. So then they created that Damier Bean print, which is, you know, like the checkerboard print. Yes, yes. So that was like the first print to count to counteract counterfeiters back in the day. Uh, and I think that was like in the 1880s. Wow. Um, but yeah, it's been, like you said, it's been going so on they, for they were, over they were, 50 they were years. They were making knockoffs back then. They are making knockoffs, like, yeah, in, their own, in the shed, in the, in the garden. That's crazy, 100%, man. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, what, what did you, what's your opinion about it? How, well, actually, how do you authenticate yeah. your stuff, man? Because, I mean, the, I've seen fakes. Now, I don't know too much about, like, the, the, yeah. the garments, but in terms of footwear and sneakers. Yeah, they're good. Uh, the fakes are insane. Yeah. I imagine they're probably even better in designer. Yeah, for sure. I think... Um, in in luxury like in luxury and anything they have like they have to be good but like there's 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 obviously pros and cons of doing it and i understand why people buy fakes 100 percent, yeah for sure like whether you agree with it or not it will not change the fact that people still consume fakes like i just did a documentary with i saw that man. it was sick man. yeah abc australia sick uh, which is on youtube now like they flew over from australia interviewed us interviewed some people in manchester interviewed so cool man. like they went on a police raid in manchester to wow. do to do like raid a fake place basically and like there's like it's such a troubling industry because it, do, it doesn't just affect the brands it affects like it it, it, it fuels and gives money to like gangs and like and like organizations drug, drug organizations yeah. and yeah like it's it's a nasty naughty industry um so like what 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 we can do to stop it is just be like really good at authentication so the pros of buying authentic buying fake stuff is like it's cheap 
And I think that is the only, only pro because like you shouldn't buy it to fit in because you're not buying it for the right reasons and it is just destroying you personally. Yeah, yeah. The, that the, the, hope, the yeah. cons of it is like, it, it's not the real thing. So it will, fo- it will fall apart after, after, after a while of using it. And like, it doesn't make you feel any better. Like it might make you feel good for like wearing it, but then like for the, for the first bit of it, but like, then you set yourself a standard to everyone else and you portray this person that you're not. So it's just not a wise way of living your life. Like I'm quite philosophical in, in that sense of thing. And this is, this kind of topic makes, like brings it out of me. Like yeah, it's yeah. just, it's not a good way to lead your life. Like it's effectively living a lie, you know? Yeah, yeah, I get that. And, all, and people will comment and be like, oh, it's only because you buy and sell pre-love luxury. It's only because you sell the real things and stuff like that. And yeah, I get it. I get your point of view, but like, People buy fake everything, like yeah. fake iPhones, yeah. fake T-shirts, like fake Nike stuff. Like people buy fake everything. Like it's a lifestyle. There's, there's the, yeah, I think here there's a deeper root problem, and yeah. that's the idea of fitting in, yeah, which yeah, yeah. I completely understand. I'm not. But I've got a my opinion on it is 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 clouded in the sense that obviously now I'm you know I'm a little bit older. I'm in my twenties. I've got a bit more money to afford the stuff I want, yeah. and I don't have to. I don't have to buy fakes. Yeah, so yeah, I can yeah. still fit in by buying the real thing yeah, right? Yeah, if I yeah. subconsciously want to. Yeah. And I recognize that. So it's a bit, so I, I completely do understand why yeah, people yeah, do yeah. it. And I and I, I I would like to say I wouldn't buy fakes mm. if I was like 16 now, 15 yeah. now. But at the same time, I just don't know because there's so much pressure to fit in on yeah. social media. Yeah. So I am a bit, I do completely understand why people do it. Especially now because when we, how old are you? I'm 25. 25, yeah, very similar age. So when, when, we were in school. Social media wasn't as big no, as it is now. No, nowhere near, like, man. The, especially with TikTok. Like the like the pressures. Like my girlfriend's little sister's in school, and like it just sounds horrendous yeah, the I way bet. people communicate on socials now. Like in regarding with even like the teachers and the peers and stuff like that. Like it's so heavy. Like I don't think like I I would not I wouldn't survive in school. But it'd be so hard to to not to to be different to be that black sheep. You know. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, because the judge, the like the the judgmentalness. That's not even a word. But Could, I, but you'll get the piss taken out of you when you were in school. When we were in school back in the day. But now people will take the piss out of you online and it could get yeah it's so of views. different man yeah it's so different it's crazy yeah you go you, crazy you, yeah the, the kind of like bullying is is no longer just internal at school yeah it's it would wild. be like now i completely feel so sorry for them though. yeah it's tough it's tough and especially in the day and age we live in is it, it is difficult but yeah i mean like you said um, yeah so anyway how do we do it so yeah. this is what i say to like anyone who asks me this like my mate is like a joiner like he would work works with woods and and like i would go up to him and be like because he does a lot of work for us in, in the unit. I'm like, how the hell do you do that? Mm. And he's like, well, I've just done it for a long time and I've, 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 I've in- improved my skills. And that is basically what authentication is. It's just your job. Like, you know, yeah. you do it. Yeah. Um, Roy Keane Roy Keen said it about a postman. It's like, yes, you know yes, I mean? yes, yes. Like, that's a great cliff if you can put that in there. Yeah. Um, but like, we've just been doing it for so long. Like when we first did it, don't get me wrong, we bought fakes. We just ne- obviously never sold them on, but we learned from them. Like we'd get them in and we'd be like, after seeing thousands of thousands of pairs of the same shoe or thousands of uh, uh, say of the same bag, you know instantly when you touch it, when you smell it. Yeah, when you- the smell is a big thing, oh. man. No one, no one gets me. And I, 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 sometimes I go to sneaker events, right? And I start smelling these shoes and people look at me like, bro, what the fuck is this guy yeah. doing, man? Just before I buy them. And uh, look, I'm, def- I'm no professional authenticator, but I'm pretty good at it now just because of the amount of shoes that have come in. Yeah. And certain shoes, certain shoes I'm very good at. Yeah. Like I could just tell like there was a pair of Air Max patterns that came in yesterday and I, me and my, my, my guy, Ben, who works with us, just, we just opened them up and we're like, nope. Yeah. 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 Like, it's straight that away. Quick. Nope. It's that quick. Done. Uh, some pairs that have been pre-loved and I haven't seen too much of. I, I honestly, I'm not sure. Yeah. But again, those guys, the guys we work with are pretty good and we yeah. also pay, every shoe goes for an authentic, we pay it for a legit check every yeah. shoe regardless. Yeah. 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 Because that means the customer can have a receipt if they yeah. want. And um, it, it backs you up just in case it is a really good yeah, one. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. We're in a position hard. now where like, like me and my brother are really good authenticators. Don't get me wrong. Like when we're out together and we're walking down the street, like we can spot That's fakes cool. across, That's across it. the road. That's you it. say it's cool, but it's also a bit like a bit, a bit embarrassing for us. Yeah, you know? yeah a little bit like <laughs> a bit sad. Yeah. A bit sad, a that's probably bit, the right but word. Um, but we're, in, we're fortunate enough now to be able to hire really good authenticators. Oh, so you're full-time? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. So we sick. don't authenticate the product anymore. Like, don't get me wrong, if they need a hand, if they want our opinion on it, um, we will we we'll, we'll sit down with them and go through it all obviously but yeah we, we've just we've yeah we've got a sick team man what, what, is, has there been any that 
uh, been any fake or been any items that come in you can't authenticate and it's like wow there's because it's pre-loved as yeah. well and there is that idea of that some things can wear and tear yeah 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 so that's what i mean like new stuff is so much easier to authenticate because like you've got a direct comparison to yeah. what it should be like yeah, yeah yeah so like a 2023 louis vuitton bag if you, you if it was new and you got given it, you could literally buy the Louis Vuitton back off the website, compare it, and then you'd know for future then and you'd be able to authenticate it. But because ours are really old seasons, they're not really old seasons, that makes it sound like we sell really old stuff, but like like three, four, five years old, some yeah. of the stuff, naturally it wears down. So naturally it will be different to the new stuff. So what we have to go off is like all our knowledge and experience of stitching, of smells, of textures, of fonts, um, of codes, but we use AI as well. So there's this machine that we use, which basically like microscopically takes pictures of the materials. Uh, so it will go from like the canvas, then the leather, then the hardware. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, it is really cool to be fair. It's a company based out in New York. It's sick to be honest. Um, so we use that on stuff that we're not sure on. And then it will get back to us with a answer in like, if they've already got it in the database, it would take less than an hour. But if they have to do some more research and pattern it up. So basically it will send these images off and the AI will match it up to all the yes. mi millions there's, of pictures there's that they've places got. like that. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. yeah. So if it matches up, it would be like, yeah, it's fine. It's good. And it's like, it's a real problem in the pre-love world as, as, as you'll know. Um, and then if they don't know, they say unidentified. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then if, if it's not genuine, they, they won't say it's fake. They'll just say like, don't buy it. You know, mm. because like people don't like you don't want to say it's fake. To yeah, people. you can't guarantee. You yeah. can't, I guess, guarantee. But it. like being an authenticator, there's you like you can't be an authenticator. Like no one's giving you a certificate to be like you're an authenticator now. Like it mm. is authentication is just a matter of opinion. Yeah, and it's how much you trust the opinion of that company or that That's person. True. Yeah, like, that is all authentication is. Yeah. It's crazy, man. I mean, it's a, it's, it is a, it's a bit of a scary time. Yeah. Um, especially if you're starting that kind of business. But that's why I did those videos so early on because no one in the industry was doing real versus fakes or saying we've got a fake in our hands. Let me show you why it's fake because people were scared to show people fakes because they're like, if someone sees that I've got a fake in my hands, they probably think we sell fakes. Yeah. But then I was on the other side. I was like, no, like, in fact, we need to educate Educating people, people because like, the world is abundant, right? Like if people aren't buying off us this time around because they're buying off somewhere else, they probably will buy off us in the future if we give them a bit of advice or or like, because when you give something to someone for free, they feel like they owe you something yeah. in return. So that's why like content does so well, like educational content does so well for like attracting an attracting audience uh, for, for future. But like we just did so many videos around authentication and like we became known for that. Yeah. And That's like, sick. like in, so like there's five ways that you learn something. So you read, you listen, you watch, you teach, uh, you, uh, you speak, and then you teach. So like us teaching people on social media made us even better authenticators, you know, because we were constantly talking about it and yeah. we, we had to make sure that the information we were giving out to these people was so right. Yeah. And it just made us like that just think about it now like that just increased our skills so much faster than than it would have done if we never did them yeah it's mate that is so fascinating man I, that was what probably my my most uh intrigued question i wanted to ask because yeah, obviously i'm curious about yeah. yeah because i know i know a lot about it in my space but i imagine it's 10 probably a lot more of a problem in yours because mm. i imagine it's been going on for a lot longer as well well like for example obviously not with the hype stuff but which is super expensive but in your industry people could buy a fake pair of Adidas yeah. or nah, New Balance yeah, yeah. and and they're like 60, 80 quid. But if someone buys a fake one of these, it's like six, 800 quid, mm. you know? Like it's a major difference. And that's why like, if you are wanting to become a reseller, just trust is everything. Yeah. Transparency and trust is just the way to kill it in reselling. Oh, well, you heard it here first. <laughs> I think, uh, sir, we're going to wrap up. Amazing. That was Ben. That was honestly, mate, so, so good. No, I, uh, so I love good. doing these things. So thanks so much for having what, me what, what, what have you got planned next, man? What's next for, for you personally in the business a little bit? Just like I said earlier on, 
um, I don't think it was recording when, when I was discussing it, like really changing what we do on social. So there's a book I read called Legacy and one chapter that stuck out to me the most was Change When You're On Top. Last year, we got 950,000 followers. This year, I want to get 10,000 followers who were turning into customers. Yeah. You okay, know, like cool. I really want to build a community of people who love Lutz Collective. I've just hired someone who is a real talent. She's really good. And hopefully she can do that with me alongside her. Yeah. And just create like that transparency, that trust, that authority that people love Lutz Collective, not just for the content we create, but what we actually do for the world of luxury and pre love luxury. Yeah. That's the plan. Sick man. Mm. Well, I, I, mate, I'll, I'll, I'll be keeping a close eye. Yeah, I'll be keeping a close eye. Uh, yeah, guys, check out Ben's socials, personal socials. Now you do a lot of uh, your own stuff personally yeah. as well. Now, yeah, um, as well as obviously, yeah, LinkedIn, Instagram, and TikTok. Yeah. I just, uh, I just love talking about business and 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 fashion. You know, yeah, mate, I can see why. Very, very, <laughs> very good at, it. ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much for watching. Uh, the hype report, hype report drops every Monday, six p.m. Um, yeah. Check it out. If you're on Spotify, give it a little like on the uh, little like heart button. And if you're on YouTube, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And yeah, thank you very much. And I'll see you in the next one.